Welcome to Foosball Radio. We have been waiting a long time for this moment. It's the first official episode of Foosball Radio, the ultimate foosball podcast, podcasting from the Foosball Radio studios. Hi, my name is Tom, uh, the executive producer and co-host of Foosball Radio. I'm joined by my fellow foosball fanatics, including Nino Dijon. Hello, Nino. Hello, Tom. And uh, Chuck Dooley. Tom, how's it going? Uh, You know, it's going well. Now, this episode is called Origins, and we're going to be looking into the beginning of the sport, meet the hosts, uh, Nino and Chuck, and uh, get their origins. Plus, we'll be here the origins of one of the best players on the planet. This is all coming up very soon. Foosball Radio returns in just moments. Foosball Radio, the ultimate foosball podcast. Hi, I'm Tom Robinson, executive producer and co-host of Foosball Radio. The team and I are thrilled you're taking the time to listen to the ultimate foosball podcast. Promoting the sport and telling the story of foosball one player at a time is our mission. Truth be told, we can't go it alone. So we need your feedback and input. Please take the time to email us with your thoughts, ideas, and critiques. Yep, we can take it. We'll share your feedback on future episodes of Foosball Radio, the ultimate foosball podcast. Email us now at info at foosballradio.com. We are back and ready to launch into the first official episode of Foosball Radio. And thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to lots and lots of episodes to come. Now, let's meet our hosts. First, uh, let's talk to Nino Dijon. Now, Nino, uh, you've been at this uh, this foosball thing, this foosball sport, and it is a sport, by the way, uh, for many, many years. Give me, give me an idea. Where did it all start? It started when I was a young kid with my dad, and uh, we were out fishing one day, and we went in for lunch. There was a foosball table there. Started playing, and that's where the hook. And you remember what kind of table that was? I want to say it was a a, a Bonzini table. Okay. Back then I want to say it was a Bonzini, but it was a long time ago, years ago. So, yeah, that's and where were, it started. And you were how old? I want to say back then it was probably eight or nine years old. But when I started playing. Really, it was probably 14, 15 years old. So it got yeah. your attention. It got my attention. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and as far as competition is concerned, uh, because, of course, you stepped into this later on as a, as a competitor. I what, did. What, how old were you when you started to compete? Uh, probably started playing 14 and, I don't know, 16, 17 competitively in our local draws uh, with uh, our co-host Chuck Dooley. Yes. Um, and a couple other people. And that really just the competition and the drive brought me in. So how many people do you in those days did you know personally who were actually playing foosball? Uh, I mean, there was a lot. I mean, foosball was huge and, uh, you know, it's, it's huge now, but foosball was huge then. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of people playing. And, and so, of course, yeah. the, the competition was pretty fierce. It was. It was. I mean, you could play all day and all night if you wanted to, yeah, in a number of different locations. So I'm, I'm curious about this because it, it's happened to me too, but I'm wondering, the, those first few times that you competed with other players who are much better than you, mm-hmm. who are kicking your tail, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why did you come back? Uh, the bug. I just got hooked. The competition, the, the drive to win, um, and, you know, just to get better. You got, know, got addicted. Got addicted and wanted to win my first trophy. It was it was important to me when I was growing up. You know, and I totally get that. Yeah, so, absolutely. And then uh, the sport evolved more, and I and I grew more with it and learned more about it. And ever since then, it's been my uh, forte. Yeah, yeah. Let's put it that way. So, and and today you are you are what you're considered an expert. An expert. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's taken a long time, of course, to get to that level. It has. And and how often do you tour? Uh, we tour quite a bit, you know, with my son. We go to a lot of tour stops. And Sam Dijon is becoming a legend unto himself at the age of 10, correct? He is, he is. And my daughter too, Hannah, she's, uh, she's Hannah been Yeager. playing. Yeah, yeah, she's been playing quite a bit too. And, you know, we're trying to go as much as possible. It's yeah. way to compete. Yeah. No doubt. I mean, this is, uh, it almost sounds like a family vacation. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat, somewhat, but t- truly, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, not so much, yeah. No. And uh, what was the last time you competed together? Uh, Maryland States, yeah, and John Lee, and put on a good 
good uh, show there. That's one of the yeah. one of the best uh, tournaments on the East it Coast. Is. It is. Yeah. 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 They do a great job. Great job. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so the other thing I wanted to ask you is, first of all, uh, why Foosball Radio? Why are you here? Uh, to pr- promote the sport and uh, help grow the sport nationwide. You know, yeah. It's, it's something people need to know about and get involved with. It's, it's a, important. It's, it's, it is a sport. I mean, there's... Yes, there, absolutely. I, I was just reading this the other day that uh, uh, rock, paper, scissors. Yes. And a cornhole. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. These are now uh, uh, tournaments where people can win as much as ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars 30000 for yeah, the first it's, prize. Yeah, it's incredible that it's, uh, you know, and it's televised and foosball is not televised. And yeah. It's, it's very, very uh, alarming that it's not. Time to do something about absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So That's got to change. Nino, I'm looking forward to working with you uh, extensively with Foosball Radio. It's it's great to have you, man. Yes, thank you, Tom. Very cool. Great stuff. And uh, Chuck Dooley. So Chuck, you are you are the, uh, the the senior guy here, as far as well. He and I are pretty <laughs> thanks, much. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. everybody knows we're I'm all, old. We're all seniors. <laughs> so let's go way back. No, let's uh, let's find out about your origins. What what where did this all start for you? Well, you know, like Nino says, back when, when we first started, I started like in the late 70s, and there was foosball everywhere. It, it, yeah. I, I never played it when I was younger like Nino, but, you know, when I was, you know, in my 20s, I, you know, it just burst onto the scene. Yes. Used to, you know, go and play in bars and things like that. and, and Every bar had a table in those days, right? Every bar had uh, at, least one, at least yeah. one table. Yeah. You know, yeah. It was just, I mean, even nightclubs had had foosball right. tables i mean sure it, so do you recall the first time you saw a foosball table and what kind of table it might have been the first time huh? <laughs> i don't know if i can go back that far <laughs> you're, you're scratching a lot of dust off there this brain go. here <laughs> understood understood uh I used to play with Tom Osher a lot. You okay. Know, we yep. used to go out to the bars and, and uh, you know, do what you do when you go out to bars. And, <laughs> yes. And uh, <laughs> play foosball. For hours. You know, it, hours it, and it, hours there, and there, hours. There would be people lined up waiting to play. I mean, you know, 10 quarters at a time. Right. Uh, in, in place, ready to play the next guy. They you actually know? charged right. quarters back in those days? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, it was a lot of money being made on football back then, trust me. A lot more money back then than there is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Most yeah. tables are, what, a, a dollar a throw. Back in those days, it might have been, what, 50 cents, something like quarter, that? Quarter, 50 cents. Yeah, yeah okay. I think okay. it was quarter, I remember. Yeah. You're bang for your buck, no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah, I think it started as a quarter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Hey, you win, you stay on the table and play all night. You, you know? win. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah, I, I mean, get that. And if you lose, you have to wait 10 games to right. get back on. Get back on. So tell me about this, Chuck. The first time you stepped into a major tournament, let's say a state or, or, or a national tournament, what was it like for you? Uh, well, I, I didn't really start playing in big tournaments right away. I, I started, I was more of a bar player for, for many years. Sure. Uh, what what happened with me is uh, our local tournaments. We found uh, Greg Mendel used to run tournaments right. In, right. in the Albany area. There's yeah. a name everybody seems to know. Yeah, and uh, you know, you know knows we'd we'd go to tournaments and it'd be twenty thirty teams. Yeah, you yep. know, on a on a Wednesday night. It was a long night if you were winning. Sure, you know, if if you're losing, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it, it's uh, but I actually, know. you know, more so back then than now. People didn't mind losing because then you got to play on. The smack talking table. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. You know, from one table to another. You know, you, the and, consolation and, and that, table. And that could be there more f- that could be more fun than playing, you know, a tournament. <laughs> right. You know, well, because you could play constantly. You, sure. You, you didn't have to wait for the next match. It was, right. Understood. You know, talking smack and having fun and right. laughing, you know. So was it, was it Tornado in those days or was it uh, something else in those first uh, tournaments you were playing? Well, actually, Tom, uh, <laughs> back when I first started, it was uh, tournament soccer. Tournament yeah. soccer, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, were, they were the ones that really made foosball. You know I, I got mean? you. Foosball had been around for a long, long time, but it, it wasn't out in popular places. Sure. Okay. Understood. Tournament soccer made it popular. Lee Prepard, who was the, uh, the guy that ran it, and uh, they started in 1973. 73? Yeah. yeah. Now, tournament, was tournament soccer, uh, were those uh, metal men or plastic men? What was the, what was the type of table? They, they were plastic. Yeah. Plastic, yeah. 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 They had uh, uh, like screw in bearings. I mean, real mm-hmm. ball bearings, sure. and, yep. and and they get clogged up. And people were bringing like pledge and stuff to, to <laughs> clean grease everything up, up. Grease up the, the rods, <laughs> right. pledge. Yeah, you know, instead of silicone. And, yeah, you know, your was, local furniture cleaner. <clears throat> that's what we're bringing. That's that's uh, th- yeah. Things have changed, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And 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 then you know they got huge. They had a quarter million dollar table. They quarter had, million, okay. And and that 
what that denoted was that they had a quarter million dollar tour. Right. Okay. Oh, I never knew what that meant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, that that year that they had the quarter million dollar table, they gave away a quarter million dollars on the tour. Yeah. Like in a year? In a year. And then the next year, they had the half a million dollars. I don't know if it was exactly a year, but it was close. Right. Okay. Right. You they were giving away Corvettes. You know? And cars. Were, yeah, yeah they cars. People won Porsches. Yeah. Yeah. That's astounding. You know? And then uh, they... they had the uh, million dollar table. Okay. Which means they're giving away a million dollars. And this is, a, just give me an idea. I mean, you know, the, again, we're talking about the 80s, correct? Well, this would be the late 70s. Yeah, 70s. Late 70s, early 80s. Early 80s. Late. So cars and a lot of, what kind of cash are we talking about here? Quarter million dollars, half a million dollars, and a million dollars. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, so the, let's say you took a first place in, in open doubles. What kind of a, a, a prize could you take home yeah, for that? I don't remember the exact amounts, but you're, I'm thinking, you know, 10, 20,000 for first place. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Now that's, yeah. You know I mean? Now that's competition. You know, and then compared to what, what we're paying out these days, that's, that's millionaire money, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. Understood. You, know? you could live on that, actually. Sure. Right. Yeah, if you're good enough. Interesting. Now, the, the big problem with uh, tournament soccer, and I'm getting this third, fourth, fifth hand, you know, but everybody seems to agree. When they had the, the really big tournament, the world championships, and they, they had all this money that they brought in to, to make the payouts, uh, the guy that was in charge of the money took off. <laughs> took off? Yeah. Like yeah. just sk split town? Skip the country. The country? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and that kind of put a kibosh on, on all the momentum that foosball had at that time. Really? Yeah. One individual made off with all this, this uh, all the proceeds? Yeah, I, can't, I can't remember the name. And it, it kind of, you know, it put a sour taste in all the players' uh, mouths. And it, sure. It, it kind of ruined tournament soccer and, huh. and their credibility. Yeah, and when it, it was at a, it was at a huge uh, upswing, and mm -hmm. uh, that really just took the gas out of everything. No, it, it sounds yeah. like it. It sounds like that was uh, that was uh, pretty ridiculous for for one individual to basically bring down the the, the momentum of the sport. Money, money's the the key to all evils. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, as far as uh, what happened after that, was a gap, or things just never came back to be the same? I mean. Uh, well, what happened is uh, they, they evolved to different tables. Uh, okay. I, I know I, I played on Dynamo and Hurricane. I can't remember which order. I think it was Hurricane. Yeah. Hurricane? Florida. I've heard of Hurricane. Yeah. Okay. Dynamo yeah. was big, too. Dynamo was uh, it was pretty big when we, yeah. And uh, I know uh, Johnny Lott was uh, involved in Dynamo and, and I think in the design of the table. And, mm -hmm. uh, okay. And, okay. Uh, and Hurricane, I... I I don't really know much about it. Right. They, they both started in like the 1970 area, uh, you know. Late 70s, early 80s, that early, kind of thing. Early 70s. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. They, they, didn't, they didn't start being used by the tournament players until after tournament soccer went away. Yeah. Every, every place had tournament soccer. Right. Until, yeah. Until and I think the, the next big player was Dynamo, though. I think Dynamo was the... Dynamo was much better. The table. next leader mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, out there. Okay. It was, it was a much better playing table. Right. Right. You, know, you could you could bank on it. You could do all kinds of things. Sure. So you would go to a tournament, and you could assume that they were going to have all one type or the dynamo table. Correct. Or the, yeah. Right. Okay. Correct. But it wasn't like tournaments you go to now. Back then, uh, like I used to run tournaments, and Greg ran some you know state championships and things like that. Sure. You used your own tables. You didn't have new tables come in and, and right. Oh, oh. So okay. these are tables that have okay. been out in bars and beaten up. And, okay. And Make the best of it. You know, and the standard was a little lower than it is. You, you probably had a, a new table or two for the pits. Yeah. That, that was about it. Okay. Interesting. But I mean, how many people were showing up for these tournaments? Lots. Many? Lots of people. Many, many. Oh yeah. We had uh, no problem getting people showing up. Yeah, so people are still hungry for it, the sport, and even though it took a it took a hit, you know, the sport was still there, and people wanted to play. Sure, I mean, uh, the World Championships just happened recently, uh, you know, in our timeline. Uh, when it comes to uh, in, in Lexington, Kentucky, now how many people showed up for that tournament? I think there was like four eighty or something. Yeah, four eighty, close to five hundred. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Uh, does it meet the standard though of the the past? I mean, what, well, no, what, I mean, how does that compare? Not even close. I mean, yeah. they they had thousands back then. Thousands. Yeah. Thousands in a tournament. Yeah. That, that's hard for me to to imagine. But yeah. Okay. Interesting. So yeah, so they had a lot of tables uh, set up for for these uh, these especially the ones that you were uh, running the the regional tournaments. Yeah. We yep. had, we had a lot of tables. I mean, for like a state championship like the New York State Championship that I would 
run uh, about 30 tables. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's quite a few tables for a state championship. Sure. And how long in your in your career as a as a as a player? I mean, how many years have you been going to tournaments? <sighs> uh, <phew>. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're kind of scraping off the old. Uh, well, it, the de- old it dust depends here. on on you know what you mean by going to tournaments. I mean, I, I was going to Greg's tournaments. You know, the DYPs there for many years. I really didn't start trying to compete in bigger tournaments for quite a few years. Okay. Nino was probably ahead of me on that, uh, going to the tour stops, things like that. Right, 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 right. I was just more happy going to Wednesday DYP, having some fun, and, you know. Yeah. Not quite as, as big a tour player then. No. I get I, that. I, I did. It probably, I'm going to say, uh, late 80s, early 90s is when I really started practicing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When Getting I got, serious. When I got serious, yeah. Yeah. you know. And Developing your shots and your passing and all this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. I, I would spend hours on the table every day. Yeah. I mean, it was like a job to me. And, I, and these days, I, I noticed you spend a lot of time, uh, especially with our, you know, our 518 Foosball uh, Club, you spend a lot of time teaching the younger kids how to play. And people like me, the oldest rookie on the planet, uh, <laughs> how, to, how to play the game. Uh, so you get a lot of pleasure from that? You enjoy uh, showing other people how to play? Well, I, I like to see other people get better, and, and I think it helps our sport when more people are better. Yes, you know, yep. more when, competition. When we're, when we're playing in Albany, and, and you, you can see uh, people getting better. Yep. Especially the the rookies. Sure. It, it, it makes them want to come more. It makes them want to learn more. It, yes. It, you know, it makes them, you know. Enjoy the sport more. It, sure. It gets them addicted more. <laughs> that's, that's right. Get them, get them uh, addicted and then they just they I mean, keep coming yeah. back. I think everybody that's played foosball knows that it, it, there's, there's an addiction. <laughs> oh, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good know, point. You know, when you're playing, especially, you know, in, in tournament setting, I mean, beating somebody is... is it's like a drug. Sure. You know, yeah. Like you want to do it again and sure. again and again. Yep. You know, no doubt. Like, Dominate the table and uh, keep doing it. Uh, so here's a question I've got for you. I, and I asked this uh, for Nino as well. Why foosball radio? Why are you here? I think it's a good idea to be able to uh, communicate with the foosball uh, people Community. around. I mean, yes. I mean, there's really no communication that I see out there that, that people are, you know. Which is odd, isn't it? It's, it seems like there should be more of this kind of thing going on. I know there's a, a, a good foosball uh, podcast out of Colorado and uh, another, what, out of California, something like that. But uh, yeah. Probably none of them have your professional uh, flair, though, Tom. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, so hopefully uh, that'll make ours stick around a little longer. And well, let, let's hope so. I'm looking forward to many, many, uh, many, many episodes with both you guys. I think this is going to be awesome. It's funny because the the title Foosball Radio kind of came out of a, an organic combination of the two things that I have most passion for in life, uh, <laughs> foosball and radio. Uh, and just uh, to give you a quick background of myself, I've been in the radio industry for uh, th- three decades and uh, now I'm a voice actor. So um, these days uh, I, I'm just, I want to talk about foosball. So Tom, <laughs> what's it like being in radio all your life? Think about that. I mean, all your life you've been around radio. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, I was 12 or 13. I knew what I was going to do as, as a for a living. Really, that, that early? Yeah, twelve or thirteen. What, I, what, I, what was the deciding yeah, factor? That's uh, interesting. I, I used to listen. I was born in upstate New York. Um, late at night, um, I used to listen to a station, a radio station out of Chicago, uh, Super CFL. It was uh, it was an AM station at night when the sun went down. You could pick up radio stations from all over the country. So I would sit there by myself at the age of twelve, listening to this amazing radio station out of Chicago, and I thought, man, that is the thing. That's the life. I got to do that. So that's what I ended up doing. Wow. I'll bet you uh, you probably interviewed quite a few people in your uh, career. I've had a couple. Yeah, there's been, uh, I mean, if, 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 if I don't know, I don't want to uh, speak to the, the old guys here, but. Oh, uh, come on, we're, we're old. There's a lot of us old people out there. <laughs> Spill it. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I, gotta, I can give you a couple of highlights. Uh, Roger Daltrey. Oh, uh, nice. Of the Who, yeah. My favorite band. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, he was the nicest person, too. Really, really friendly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, John Lodge of the Moody Blues. Uh, Graham Nash of Crosby, Stills, Nash. Uh, Aretha Franklin was uh, was one. Uh, and uh, that's actually an interesting piece because uh, she was on her tour bus when she was speaking to me live on, on the air. 
And I got her a little upset, but she, she, yeah, I pissed her off. <laughs> so rest in peace. Y- yes, yeah, great lady and wonderful talent, but she was not very happy with me, and she kept calling me Gary. Uh, <laughs> so, so you it, probably weren't too happy with her, right? It, it, well, you know, you got to accept that sometimes it happens like this. But and they go through so many interviews sometimes in a day; they don't remember one person from another. There was uh, occasions when I get to meet people, you know, that that uh, that I worshipped uh, as a kid. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, first person I, I met in person, uh, who was in fact uh, I interviewed and they played live in the studio, uh, Joey Molland of a band called Badfinger. Uh, they were on the the Beatles Apple label in the early '70s and had some pretty big pretty big records. I remember them. Yeah, uh, and uh, Joey was the surviving member of the band when he came through to play with his uh, his entourage, his group. Uh, and uh, boy, it was just a treat because I had all their records as a kid to cool. talk to somebody like that. But that was the first of uh, of quite a few. And and uh, yeah, I mean, oh, I, I was backstage at uh, remember the Starlight Music Theater? Oh yeah, at, yeah, yeah. That was in Latham, Theater and around uh, Latham, New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of shows we used to uh, host and uh, and uh, have to go out and, and introduce the band. And so I was there for a double bill one night with Warren Zevon and Eddie Money. Nice. There you and go. Uh, so we're backstage. I showed up with a few people from the, the radio station, and uh, there was no one back there in the, the backstage area when we first got there, except for this one guy who was just standing off in the corner, looked like a, road, a roadie, just a, a guy waiting to help out. And uh, he had a, a long braided, uh, a, like a ponytail, kind of kind of rough looking guy. So we're just standing around talking uh, amongst ourselves, and I looked over, and I glanced over this guy again. I realized, oh my goodness, that is Warren Zevon. <laughs> so I walked over very carefully and said, hi, uh, Warren, I'd, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tom. Uh, we're going to be introducing the show tonight. Uh, listen, I, it's a, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I, I had no idea you were staying. He's like, oh, hey, don't worry about it. I, you know, I've been on tour uh, for the last couple of months, and this is a really cool place, and I'm really looking for And so really nice guy. So we started talking. Uh, as we're ch- chatting, uh, Eddie Money and his entourage came bursting through the, the side stage door. <laughs> now, his, his persona was completely different. Uh, he was, uh, shall we say, loud. Uh, and uh, he had never met Warren. And uh, he noticed us talking and he came over and he wrapped his arms around Warren, like gave him a bear hug. And Warren uh, did the best he could uh, to, to be polite and, and nice to the guy. But he was, he was, Eddie was just a little too much. <laughs> Let's put it that A little overbearing. Way. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. So later on, as we were uh, talking to Eddie Money, one of the guys brought a record and had asked Eddie to sign it. And so Eddie takes the record and goes, hey, I know this record. That was my third rehab. <laughs> so there's a lot of rehab and rock and roll <laughs> <laughs> but um, very gracious very nice guy but he was you know he's completely different type of personality and uh, the the one thing that I do remember most about that night is uh, talking to Warren and, and, and bumming a smoke from, from Warren Zevon. What, what did he smoke? Uh, <laughs> Go down into the memory books <laughs> right there. Remember Vantage cigarettes? Oh, my God. Vantage. Yeah, he, he smoked Vantage, yeah. yeah. So so. I, bet, I bet you got tons of stories you could tell. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure. A few, a couple, yeah. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll get into a few of those along the way here. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this, this whole idea of foosball radio and being with you guys, first of all, I am so honored to be with you. Uh, and at the same time, get a chance to play with you guys every week in the, the 518 Foosball club uh this is a great organization uh it's it's been around since 1985 it's had a few incarnations but yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's, it's been around it's been, for a while it's been pretty constant sure. okay yeah no it's uh i gotta and, ask you tom yeah what got you into foosball oh well uh pizza pizza <laughs> pizza usually doesn't yeah, yeah, pizza yeah. does it no it's it's i still remember the night uh showing up at the local pizzeria the the italian kitchen in oneonta new york showing up on a on a winter night at the age of 14 because i would always get together with my friends there and play pinball and they had a a, a six million dollar man pinball machine in the corner of the pizzeria and we'd go there and play so we get there one night and uh, i got there first before everybody else and i realized after i got my slices sitting down i look over for the pinball machine I got my quarters. There's no pinball machine. It's gone. And in its place is this thing, this this table. Hmm. I'm like, what is this? So I, the one of the brothers who ran the place, Tony. Tony, what is this thing? He's oh, that's foosball, man. 
Now, when is this? Go give us a year. Uh, mm. Let me say 1974. 74. So you got started right. way yeah. back. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he said, hey, listen, you know, Big Tom, he called me Big Tom. Hey, Big Tom, you stick around and I'll, I'll show you how to, how to play this. this uh, it's called foosball, man, or table soccer or whatever he called it. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, it turned out it was a Bonzini table, which, you know, to me, it meant, meant nothing. Uh, but Bonzini. Bonzini. <laughs> Bonzini. Eh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that night, uh, my buddies showed up and uh, we hung out. And uh, Tony and the guys, uh, his brothers, uh, played uh, foosball with us and, you know, killed us, of course. You know, they were, they were actually from Italy and they, they knew what they were doing. Uh, and, oh, you get an Italian on a Bonzini. Oof. Oh, my goodness. They're... <laughs> They're they're fast and and uh, unforgiving, and they just had so much fun beating us up on the table. So, uh, but you know, little by little, we'd come back, uh, you know, to to have uh, pizza, you know, several nights a week, and all of a sudden we're playing this game all the time, and then uh, it drags you in. Yeah, it sucks, sucks you in. You in. Right? <laughs> and some of the guys were getting really good at playing up front, and I, you know, I enjoyed playing defense. And uh, one of my buddies from high school, we ended up uh, sneaking into a local club. A bar. Of course, in those days, drinking age was 18. So we, we, we uh, snuck into this local bar. It was a big place, and they had four Bonzini tables. And so we'd go in there and, uh, and clean, clean up uh, against the college kids who were, were attending school in our, in our town. And, I mean, just dominating them because we had been playing since we were, you know, in our early teens. So we drank for free most of the time. <laughs> That's always a good side effect. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> That's so, a plus. But that yeah. was uh, 19, I, I stopped playing in 1979, 1980, because I had discovered women. Uh, That'll and, do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, and, I think a lot of foosball players have taken breaks, you know. Exactly. A lot of it have been women and child uh, related. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. No, and, and uh, it wasn't until I met you guys at the, the 518 Foosball uh, Club in 20, 2011, uh, right after my last big radio gig, uh, I was uh, looking for something to occupy my time and found <clears throat> you guys through a, through a neighbor and uh, have not left since. Well, we're we're glad to have you. Tom. Yeah, I mean, thank you. You know, you're, you know, it's it, you guys are family for goodness sake. So uh, foosball is a family. It is. Know? It is indeed. And everybody will give you, you know, every any information you need in in the sport. Yeah. You know, so. you guys are great teachers, by the way. When, when so. we show up on Friday nights to play each other, I mean. We're we're playing with each other as a team, and we're playing against, against each other, and, right. and and you know it's it 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 changes. You know, sometimes I'm Nino's partner, sometimes I'm your partner. Right, 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 right. S sometimes I I hate Nino, sometimes <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> the love hate relationship that we have. It that's, is. It's that's it's, what family is, though, it's, right? <laughs> it's it's a never ending fascination. I gotta say, no matter you know, no matter who shows up for this uh, this DYP on Friday nights, and incidentally, if you're ever in the uh, the Albany area, Clifton Park. Friday Friday nights at a place called Trick Shots Billiards on Route 9 in Clifton Park is where we get together. We have uh, three tables actively being used, tornado tables. And if you want to play with us, we'd love to have you. Yeah, and if you want to find any information on it, you can go to our uh, Facebook page at 518 Foosball, too. Absolutely. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, we'd love to have you come there. play. In fact, we've got a, a tournament coming up uh, this this season. Uh, it's, it's during Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, it's, it's our Turkey Day our Turkey Day Smashdown. It's actually a very popular event. Uh, you'd, you'd think that Thanksgiving would be, you know, a bad time of year, but yeah, it, actually a lot of people come to visit their families. They've moved away, so now they're in town. And, they, and while they're in town, they, I mean, Thanksgiving's on Thursday. They can, they can, yeah, you know, and this see is their, on Saturday. They can Come see out. their, they can see their family on Thursday and Friday, and yeah. they still want to get away from the in-laws. This is a great place to do oh, it. Exactly, yeah. burn off a little bit of that turkey. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, yeah, I, yeah, that definitely. You know, that, and uh, get away from the crazy uncle too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can only talk about uh, the football game for so long. Uh, exactly, you know? and, and uh, hey, you know, bring the family if you want. If, I mean, yeah. if you want to play, uh, bring the kids. Uh, our our least, events are very family friendly. I mean, yeah, we really, really have, you know, lots of kids and everything in between, you know, old people like me <laughs> and me and me. Uh, you know, yeah. But hey, but it, the competition level is, is is pretty fierce. So come on out and play. Even the best player in the world has showed up for our, our Turkey Day smashdown in the past. So speaking of which, 
Uh, coming up, because this is Foosball Radio, in our first episode, we call this episode Origins. We're talking about the beginnings, of course, of the sport. We're talking about the beginnings of our own uh, experiences within this sport. Uh, we have an awesome privilege, an amazing situation coming up. We just mentioned the name. Uh, a gentleman who will be speaking with uh, directly about his origins in this industry, and in, you know, I should say, in this sport. Uh, he's coming up in just a few moments, and you are listening to Foosball Radio. We'll be back in just moments. Foosball Radio, the ultimate foosball podcast. Hey there, it's Tom Robinson, executive producer and co-host of Foosball Radio, the ultimate foosball podcast. We truly hope you're enjoying the fruits of our labor. We are doing this because of the love and passion for the sport. Speaking of which, we're now offering a limited number of sponsor slots. Tailored to your foosball-based business, we can make you a member of our team. For more information on how to sponsor Foosball Radio, Contact us at info at foosballradio.com. Let's work together to build foosball and the passion for the sport. That's info at foosballradio.com. We are back. This is Foosball Radio, and I'm Tom Robinson, along with Chuck Dooley and Nino Dijon. Uh, this is our first episode. It's called Origins. And uh, in this first episode, we are incredibly privileged. And I know I've been teasing you guys for a while about this, but uh, we have the number one foosball player in the world in front of our microphone for our first episode. Uh, Tony Sprademan. Tony, thank you for being here today. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I, I, I got to say, because this is the Origins episode, all of us are very curious. What was the first time you saw a foosball table? Well, um, I'm actually a second generation player. My dad was a, an expert level player in okay. the 70s on the tournament soccer tour. Um, so I actually grew up with a table in the house. However, I didn't take to it immediately. Ba- basically... I grew up with a table in the house, but I didn't play till around 1995 or 96. Okay. Um, oh. And the first time I actually played was at a rec center. Huh. huh. And I, I went to my local rec center after school, and because my dad I, had talked about foosball and, and everything, right. I was naturally drawn to it. So, you know, the other kids were playing pool and ping pong and, yep. you know, whatever. So I went over to the foosball table, and I just took an interest in it, and I was naturally, you know gifted as far as hand-eye coordination okay and uh, i just started beating the other kids at it and they actually held a tournament and um i actually played the tournament and won and told my dad about it wow and but it was with the other kids it's not like it was an actual tournament right. with, sure you know. sure but uh so so I, I came home told my dad and he was super excited he's like foos you know and he told me all the old stories about how he used to hitchhike from tournament to tournament <laughs> we're from i'm originally hitchhike. from milwaukee wisconsin and he would hitchhike from you know milwaukee to portland milwaukee to seattle all for these tournaments he was at the playboy club for the uh the for, playboy club the, yeah uh-huh. for the tournament in chicago That's so he i mean he he really did a and a full-on tour, you know, hitchhiking it, you yeah. know, in, in style. So <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Nice. So it was. Pretty so I was amazing. The fact that I was able to connect with him on something, you know, really drew me in because I'm really close with my dad, and it was gotcha. just something that we can do together. And you know, I was like happy that he was happy that I was playing. You know, yeah. so it was really pretty so, cool. So what well, age was that when you started? I was well. That was around, I was about 10 years old, oh, okay. and then I didn't play my first tournament until I was about 11, and that was, I, I saw my first tournament in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it was in 96, 1996, Wisconsin State, and I actually wasn't allowed to play in it. Why? Um, it was a league, a league championship, and it was 21 and up. Oh. So yeah. I walked into the ballroom, and I, I got to see all of the, the tables lit up, mm-hmm. and it was actually... An interesting tournament because it was right around the time Striker was out and Johnny Lott was promoting the Striker table. So it was half Tornado, half Striker. 
So I was going to ask you what tables you were using. Yeah, yeah. And, and you actually had to flip a ta flip a coin to see which table you wanted to play on, and then flip another coin for you know ball and side. Wow. No doubt. So like the lower rated players would actually pick striker because they'd think they'd have a chance against a better player right. on a foreign table. You know. Sure. So that was my first introduction to an actual tournament, and um, I got to play one shortly after that. Ninety six Illinois State. It was at uh, Liberty Lanes in Carpentersville, Illinois. And, yeah, I got, cool. and I got a fourth place beginner doubles trophy. And I still have it till this day. <laughs> that's no awesome. Yeah, that's serious. awesome. Those first trophies are the best. Oh, it, yeah. and that's when I truly loved, loved yeah. playing. Yeah. I, I know when that's I was great. starting out, you know, and I was, you know, just starting. I, that that All I wanted was that, that was trophy. trophy. Yeah. You know, I, I looked at it and I'm like, I got to win that. You know, I got to practice so I can win that trophy. And yeah, I, I had I had certain goals as a kid. It's like first, you know, I got a trophy. Then I wanted to win, you know, a tournament. And then, like, of course, everybody wants a jacket, you right. know. And then, you know, I wanted to win. Once you get a jacket, then it's like the next level. You move up to expert, whatever. But one of my main goals was uh, for for years was to get on an Inside Foos video, you know. <laughs> and and I remember I was That's like, cool. it was uh, I think. Nine, about 2000 or so i made my first video and i lost you know so you? i'm like okay. and i lost so my next goal after that was like well now i got to make the video and win and you win. know right. and it's yeah. so you just have you know small goals to keep you going and to keep succeeding and some, give something to shoot for you know that's so, great so when you first started playing uh foosball uh competitively uh what was the competition like in those days um, I mean, it was actually pretty damn tough. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of players back then yes. and, and it's not like it was in the seventies, but this is, we're talking mid nineties and there was, you know, mid nineties and there was, there was still. The, well, the, the, I, I just noticed that, you know, we were looking at uh, the 96 worlds that ESPN did. Right? Yeah. They had 4,000 people at that tournament. I don't know if that was accurate. That's uh, what they said. That's yeah. what it said. That's what they said. What I, said. I actually find it hard to believe. Yeah point is is that there were there was definitely more players back then i don't know the exact numbers i'm right. sure I was 11 right. years old but was there a, an individual that you said to yourself that's the guy that's the woman i gotta beat in order to say i've made something of myself is there an individual well it's funny because i have a few players that i really looked up to that i kind of emulated and wanted to be like um but i also wanted to beat them as well but one of them is tommy atkinson tommy atkinson was the one player that stood out to me that right. that had 100% fire. He was like he was a, a fierce a, competitor. He was a showman. Yeah. He was aggressive. And then another one was Don Swan. I was a huge Don Swan fan because he he had style. Like he had an awesome style, real unique kind of style of play. And so I, looking back, I could actually see similarities. I'm like a hybrid between both of them. I'm pretty okay. aggressive, like Tommy. Maybe not as I'm definitely not as mean as Tommy. Right. Was, right. <laughs> you know, but. Uh, uh, but I've kind of got a fast pace, unique style, kind of like Swan. So I could kind of see where that comes in. Um, sure. Terry Moore at the time was the number one player. And he lived okay. in Chicago, which was 90 miles away from Milwaukee. So I got to see him play on a more regular basis than the rest of the guys. So I tried to take bits and pieces from each one of those guys. Like Terry, you, you won't see any part of Terry Moore's game in my game. However... Okay. The thing that he was known for is just being 100% consistent all the time and right. making good decisions and playing smart. So I would actually tell myself as a kid, I'd be in a match. And like a lot of kids, there's we don't have discipline mm -hmm. and we, we, we play really fast. So when I realized like, hey, I need to move to this next level. What do I need to do? I need to value my possessions. I would actually tell myself, think like Terry. Yeah. Think like Terry. And that would go through my brain. I would tell myself, you know. Anytime I felt myself going, you know, trying yeah. to play really fast, rush, rush. that would be one thing I, I, I said it in my brain over and over. And so even though you can't see any similarities like that, I tried to take a little piece of his discipline and incorporate it in my game. And so yeah. I actually great. tried to, I love the way Terry played, you know, and I tried to actually, you know, do a brush pass and stuff like he did, but it takes so much patience. Oh, and, and it's, it's funny like, because when, when I started, I, I started with a far wall tic tac because I was too short to see the near wall. So I, I would do a, I would do a wall pass on the near wall, but I couldn't see if I actually caught it because right. I, I didn't use stool or a stool or a box or anything like that. So as I grew, everyone was like, "Well, you know, you got good your ball control is good, but your five bar needs work." Why Terry Moore is the number one player, 
and you have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So they said, you need to do, if you want to be successful, you want you have to do a near wall brush or you need to do a brush pass. So I actually moved to a near wall brush for about a year and I won a couple of rookie titles with it, but I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, it's I, just, I, I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and a lot of people, if you look, in my opinion, you could see someone's personality coming out in the way that they play. Sure. You know, you yeah. express yourself through the way that you play. So, so it, it didn't feel like me. It, it wasn't me. And and I, and when you play, you want to have a good time. You want to have fun. And, That's what it's about. Um, so when did you first recognize you had your own style? I don't know if it was something I really recognized. It's just something that came naturally. Right, just happened. Yeah, yeah I didn't say, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this to be different. I want to be right. an individual. That was never the case. Right. It sure. was what felt right to me and what I enjoyed doing. Right. And, and, I, and that's how I enjoyed playing foosball. So. Now, here's the thing that, uh, and we've been talking about this a bit too, is, is there is uh, an international scene when it comes to, to foosball. So for, from your perspective in your career, when was the first time you stepped out of the United States and went on to, to compete with uh, people from the world? What, when was that, what was that like and when did that happen? Um, it had to be 2004, the ITSF World Championships. Okay. And this was actually before they did team events. It was an individual competition. And I qualified at the 2004 Nationals, I believe. And okay. it was held in St. Vincent, Italy, in the oh, nor wow. north of Milan, in the, I believe they call it the Valle d'Aosta. And it's in the Italian Alps. Beautiful country. Yeah. And I went over there by myself. And this is actually a funny story. <laughs> so I was an up and comer at the time. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, when you have a young kid and I was a fiery kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I had an attitude mm -hmm. and I'm, I got something to prove, chip on my shoulder. And, sure. And, uh, I had a couple of tough matches with Robert Morris and mm. Rob is also a fiery player and Billy Pappas and I were playing doubles and Rob, you know, muttered some stuff under his breath and we we're like, man, this guy's an asshole, you know, <laughs> yeah, right, right. you know, we didn't, and so we, we got off on a really bad foot. So, so Rob and I were the two American players that qualified at the world championships that year. And uh, I show up to the to the tournament like, okay, we got your room comped, we got everything, you know, your flight. They, pay, they reimburse me, mm -hmm. and they go, okay, well, you know, and they go, oh yeah, and by the way, you're rooming with the other American player, Rob Mars, and I'm going, oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, like I got a room with this guy, you know, so so I actually had to room with Rob Mars, and it was actually a really important lesson because I. I I really didn't like him, but okay. I only knew him through foosball. Right. Okay. Right. So this particular weekend, I got to know Rob Mars as a person opposed to a foosball player. And it was a really important lesson, the fact that I learned to separate foosball and personal relationships. And yes. I really got to see that he is an awesome dude. And we've been like best buddies ever since. We realized like we're into the same music. And so, sure. so it was really a good life lesson for me made a connection so, that you didn't have before which yeah is, exactly yeah, so it was good for me because i was i was fairly young you know yeah and foosball is the only thing i cared about right. but now I'm, I'm i learned that there's you know there's people you know i, I try to be as much of a robot and <laughs> as possible on, right. on the table but sure. there's there's people you know the actual person behind all of it so it was, it was really cool but what? back to the back to the um actual competition it was yes. in it was in uh the valle de Aosta, northern italy and Never touched another uh, a different foosball table in my life. I've oh. only I've only played tornado. Had yes. no idea what to expect, and it was a super humbling experience in the fact that you know it opened my eyes to comp the different styles of play, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't know any better back then. I was like, I actually played really well for n for never touching another table. And you have to realize that I play a different style than everybody on tornado. Well, that yes. tornado style doesn't translate to the other tables. So I can't tic tac the way that I do on the other tables. So I actually had to do a brush pass, which is completely out of my comfort zone. This is what stepping into competition and never touching that table before ever. Never, never even seen them. Wow. And what table was that? Um, back then the official tables were, uh, tornado, Garlando, Roberto sport, Bonzini. Mm -hmm. And then it was actually, uh, Euro soccer made by uh, Jupiter, which is okay. a, a Belgian a Belgian table, and it, it's an amazing table, really cool, but complete different style. style. Um, yep. And I, I ended up finishing third, 
third in the world on all these other tables that I've that I've never played, and I beat a few of the top players. Um, no I beat kidding. Rob Atha. Wow. I beat uh, Gilles Perrin on, on Garlando. I beat him, um, who's a, a top Swiss player and one of the the best guys out there. And but I didn't know any better. I was just being aggressive. Like sure. I, I I didn't I didn't really play the traditional style that those guys would play on, on their tables. Right. And, I, and I remember I ended up losing to Federico on Bonzini. And was, that was an interesting... Uh, Federico Colignon. Col yeah. Colignon, yeah. 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 I lost to him on Bonzini, and I'd never seen a Bonzini before. And I, and I looked at it, and I go, what the hell is this <laughs> thing? I, 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 I had, you know, it was really, really tough on me. But at first, I was kind of like bitter and like, this thing sucks. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. as time went on, I, I learned to open my eyes a little bit. And I said, okay, instead of just being upset at the table and saying, oh, this thing sucks compared to Tornado, right. I watched the French players and I watched how they played on it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a Tornado. So you, you, you can't treat it like a Tornado. So you need not to do all. what works on, on that style. And, right. and I adapted and... Um, I really learned to understand it and I really be began to like it. And, yeah. you know, I, I had one, I, I've got a Bonzini and I've had Do one you? for a while and I love playing on it. I think it's a blast. So it's funny. I had the reverse experience because at the age of 14, I was playing at a pizzeria uh -huh. uh, on a Bonzini. I'd never seen anything before uh, that. Yeah. And Bonzini was all I played right through college. And then went away from the sport and came back in with Tornado, and I thought it was clunky. Yeah. Mm. Kind of like, what is Real this? Real blocky and heavy. Yeah. The handles are big, so. Sure. Yeah. Total change. How many, out of curiosity, competitors were in Italy at that World Cup? Um, that one was a qualifier only. Oh, okay. So I don't know if there, you know, if it was top 32 or something okay. like okay. that. Okay. I, gotcha. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't a huge turnout. It was an in invitation only, and and. and it was actually really cool because um, we walked down to the foosball hall and someone said that there's another tournament going on down the street. I'm like, well, what do you mean? This is the world championships. Why would there be any other foosball tournament hmm, the going same on time. at the exact same time in this little town? It was a tiny town. Huh. And, uh, you know, we, we take a walk around the corner. There is the Italian, the Italian championship going on. <laughs> and, the, you know, they play a different style. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, they call it um, Al Volo. And we went over and watched this, the Italian guys playing their style. And the, I mean, it was insane. They don't stop the Dude, ball. No. It was, it was crazy. Right. I mean, yeah. these guys are sweating. They're like playing no, sh no shirts and stuff. And <laughs> Is that where they throw the ball in there? Yeah, they, they just... throw the ball in <laughs> and they have a different set of rules and they jar the hell out of the table and the tables are turning sideways and do it, you know, one eighties and three sixties. <laughs> but here's the best part is we looked, they're playing for cars. First place cars. is like two uh, two Fiats. Wow! Yeah, they're playing for they're playing for cars. Though. I'm like, holy cow! I had no idea, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So it was a total eye opener going over yeah. there and seeing that foosball isn't just limited to you know the United States and sure to, or to just one table. So. And how many times have you been to to uh, other countries to play? Have you kept track? I have not kept track. Yeah. It's somewhere in the. 20 uh i've probably somewhere around 20 25 different countries and then overall visits it's got to be right 30 to 50 i, don't, I have no idea any <laughs> favorites yeah i actually love um I, I love costa rica because of the people um great people down there really mm. nice really uh laid back atmosphere the country itself is beautiful as far as it's probably know. the most beautiful place i've ever been to yeah I mean, yeah you've just, got the caribbean on one side you got the pacific yeah. on the other you've mm. got mountains rainforest monkeys it's, in the trees it's, it's a mecca for uh, surfers actually i mean yeah it's, it's some of the best surfing w waters they have to go around and check people's passports because they they stay longer than they're supposed yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> i was down there uh a year and a half ago or so and it was there was a tournament down there and it was actually during the world championships of surfing in Hako. And that was, it was going on during the foosball tournament. Oh, so wow. we ended up going nice. afterwards and the surf was, you know, really rough and big waves and stuff. So it was pretty crazy, cool. but that, that was great. Um, I've had a few interesting trips. Um, my favorite European city had to be, I, I really liked Prague. Um, but I've also visited, uh, you know, I've been through, Taiwan and China. And, nice. Yeah. I've uh, been to Malaysia a handful of times. Now, uh, were, were you just in Afghanistan for the troops? Uh, or, yep. Yeah. That, that was a whole nother. That wasn't even a tournament. Um, right. That was um, a r amazing experience. I actually got invited by the German army to a NATO base to go to Masri Sharif, Afghanistan. 
Wow. So it was the German ar- army that invited you. I was actually invited by the Germans huh. because um, foosball is huge in Germany. Yes. Right. And and it's just a part of their culture. Mm-hmm. So it was essentially like a USO type thing. Like you go over there and you do, you know, support the troops sure. and give them something to do and break up the, the monotony mm. of military life. Um, so they invited me over and it, again, it was a NATO base. So there was American <coughs> troops as well. So I got to meet all of the, the American guys and we would go around the base to, uh, each section. Like for instance, we went to the, the air force and the German air force has their own rec area with their own table. So we'd go me and the, the junior world champion, uh, Raf, uh Raphael, Raphael Hoppel, yeah. mm. um, he was also there with me and we would do just promos and demos and play, play with the guys and, so we would go to the, the Air Force, the telecommunications sector. We went to the germ. There's a radio station there, and we went and played. And every one of these places have their own foosball table. No, like doubt. they love yeah. it. Like the troops yeah. loved it. That's great. And uh, the tables that we played on were were called uh, the Beast. And the Beast is a the Beast. The Beast is a table made by Ulrich Sport, which is the official table of the P4P tour in Germany. Huh. Which um, that's coming up shortly too. Correct. Um. I, no. I don't know, no, to be okay. honest with you. The Beast. I want to try The Beast. The Beast, yeah. It's like the Milwaukee's best, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but we, we actually, we held a tournament for the for the troops and anybody working, you know, on base. And the winner of the tournament got to take those tables that were donated by Ulrich Sport back to, like, their barracks their or their, their area. Nice. So it was really cool and awesome. they really got into it. So That's great. But the fact that I was able to go... Uh, you know to afghanistan yeah was i was a little hesitant at first to be yeah, honest with yeah. you like, sure but i was surrounded by you know thousands of soldiers that are all you know they're playing they're playing foosball and they're like packing heat you know <laughs> they got <laughs> guns on their hips you don't want to get a little them aggressive off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it yeah. could be yeah. a problem yeah. Yeah. it was a really great experience though i, awesome. I gotta say tony one of my favorite matches in in quite recent history was watching you playing the finals of the DYP in Maryland. With Braden, with, yeah. With Braden Jones. Braden Jones, yeah. Seven years old, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that was, that's just amazing that, you know, I mean, it, you, you showed such patience with them, and, and you know, it, it was great. Well, I, I loved well, it. F- first off, that kid played awesome. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'd, lo- I'd love to take all the credit, but he actually really held his own. Yeah, he did. I mean, he, he really did. And the thing is with kids um, – I look him. I look at him as like a blank canvas. Yep. They have they have no experience, and you could tell them anything, and they'll listen. Um, opposed to playing with that stubborn old pro who's yeah. like stuck, stuck in his, in his ways. ways right. and, is that yeah. true? Like, you know, does Sam listen to everything you say? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Well, Sam's yeah. already pretty he'll, good. I he'll, mean, he'll listen to what Tony says, but yeah. he won't listen. Maybe, to maybe. <laughs> but but anyhow, a special Braden. Braden was awesome, by the yeah. way. Like he was. Um, really responsive and he really he, he did a great job and and he's got awesome parents brian jones oh i love brian and amy, amy are yeah. great people you know great people and they raised a good kid yeah. so but that was to be honest with you you know i play a lot of these tournaments and i, I get bored i really do i i it, it takes a lot to really get me mm. motivated and fired up. Well, it's got to be like work for you. I mean, because well, you're doing it all the time. It is, but it's I, I enjoy work. You know, yeah. I enjoy doing what I do. It's, it's better but than it's, what I did for sure. <laughs> yeah, but like anything, it's just it becomes repetitive. Right. And this, in particular, really drove you. Oh, I was. Yeah, I, I super fired. I'll up. tell you what. That tournament, I was more nervous playing with him because i wanted to win so badly Bad. for him yeah mm-hmm. I, I i was shaking i had adrenaline i i'm not even joking <laughs> i was I honestly it. nervous I and i because i wanted it so bad for him yeah that's crazy. um and when you know we got put in the loser's bracket we had to come back and i had to play a, a local guy who's from florida so he he knows a lot of my little gimmicks sure. and i have a lot of free free shots that i could get on people mm-hmm. well i played him a handful of times so he's not going to give me anything easy and him and uh, as Alan Montrone and Donald Wilson, yeah. they, they they played really really well. And and Donald's a great player. As sure well. is. So yeah. it was not it was not like an easy match, you know. It's super cool um, though. It but, was awesome. And well, if you look in that match, I started kind of choking towards the end. 
I was. It was tight. <laughs> well, we won the first game of the second set, and then the second game, I think we had a huge lead, and I just couldn't score, and I was getting mm. real tight, and we ended up losing, and I'm going, oh no, you know, I, I blew it, <laughs> and I don't ever get that way. I never feel That's like a lot of I don't, pressure. I don't, I don't, I don't, I typically don't feel that pressure. I don't even care yeah. if I'm playing the worlds, and I felt more pressure in that match than I have in years, it, and. I That's just cool. So it was really, a really awesome experience. We, you know, luckily we came back and and got the win. And I actually uh, got choked up afterwards. Sure. It was nice. pretty cool. You, I, were, you know, you were not alone. There was a lot of people. Yeah, it really got that me. Were, that were just you it, know, it was genuine. It was, it was a wow moment. Yeah, it really sure. was. Yeah. So anyway, it was awesome. And, and hopefully he remembers it and like keeps playing. Oh yeah, he's Hope. gonna be a good competitor. Can you imagine though. I mean, this is this is a kid is seven when he's seventeen. He's saying. To his friends, hey, I played with the number one player in the world in foosball. I don't play it anymore, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, he said to me a few things throughout the tournament that were so funny. It was, <laughs> for instance, our, our first match, our very first match, he's just such a cute little kid yeah, with a southern is. draw, oh, you yeah. know, yeah. and he's so calm and mellow. And so we win our first match, and he's, you know, we shake hands and he slaps the points back and he goes, he goes, first one of the day. You know? <laughs> All right. I think kid, kid's seven, you know? I didn't see that Okay. Too. First one of the day. I'm like, I laughed a little bit. Oh, yeah. Next match, we win our next match. Same dish. He slaps the points back and goes, I could do this all day <laughs> and all night. That's what he said. That's so, a, and we, so, so these beautiful. are these little, you know. That's great. So we end up, um, we end up losing. And we, you know, after we come back and win, we want, we, you know, came back, won the tournament. Everything was great. And he came up to me afterwards. I'm talking three, four hours after the tournament was done. And he said the cutest thing to me. He goes, I, I wish we were still playing. And I said, well, what do you mean? We won. That we achieved the <laughs> ultimate goal. Like yeah. we won the tournament. Like you're seven and you just made like a couple hundred bucks, right, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, but he didn't care. He just wanted to play. Right. And it was genuine right. and it was it's the love of football. And he truly just enjoyed every moment yes. of playing. Oh, yeah. He didn't care about winning or losing. He just had a blast being in the spotlight and having crowds. And It's awesome. So yeah. uh, it was really cool. He's cute as a button, that oh, yeah. little boy. Yeah. He is, boy. So while we're on the topic of, of uh, the future, what uh, – uh, any shining stars you could mention at this point that you're, you're noticing uh, they're going to be big? There's a bunch of them out there. Yeah, yeah. Lots there's a, there's a lot of. Oh, I mean, up and comers. There, there's and a lot of up and comers. There's um, the whole New York scene, obviously, with the school with the school system, yes. the John O'Brien system. Um, right. There's a bunch of really good players. Obviously, everyone knows uh, Sam Dijon. He's like mm -hmm. superstar amongst the youngsters. Um, but then you also have a lot of the kids that, that people don't know about, right. you mm -hmm. know, and, and someone like Sam, he's great, but in order to get to the next level, you got to really stick with it. Like right. who, who knows, like right. you can get a girlfriend sure. and mm -hmm. quit playing, you know, you just never know. know. So yeah. it's, it's really hard to say. It happens Ho to a lot of foosers. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So point is there's a lot of good players, uh, uh, young players coming out of the school system that I've seen and you never really know like how far are they going to take it because they're just so young. Right. Um, then you move to the next uh, like upper echelon of, uh, you know, a little bit kids that are a little bit older, like uh, Sullivan, Sullivan yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. obviously, I mean, she's already reached the upper echelon of the, the women's players, you know, being, she was in the finals this year of wow. women's Phenomenal. singles. She won women's doubles last year at the Worlds. And she's 14. like you, a second generation. Second, second generation. Yeah. Grew up yeah. on the tour. Yeah. Um, and then after that, you have guys like uh, Blake Robertson who mm -hmm. are becoming a, you know, he's, he's younger than me, but he's becoming like a staple on the tour. He's one of the top players and he's gotcha. really come on strong the past like couple of years. Uh, he's always been a good player, but mm -hmm. he's becoming more consistent, right. you know, Got which it. is so... I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many players. You just never really know how right. far are they going to take it, and what happens in life. And does sure. anybody, uh, anybody worry you as far as the competition? Oh, and I wanted to mention one other player before I'm uh, Tommy Orr Jr. You can't yeah. forget about him. Oh, he's, he's a beast. He plays yeah. great. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, he's got a really cool style too. It looks awesome. Well, you know? if you have your, if you guys are playing together yeah. in back to back, you wouldn't know. No, it's. Uh, I watched yeah, you stick. playing against him at Maryland also. It's and phenomenal. He gave you such a hard time. Mm -hmm. I mean. Well, I've never had to block myself before. I didn't have a game plan. You I didn't would know. think it was Tony <laughs> yeah, playing, but yes. The point mean, is, there's a lot of really, really uh, talented, He's, big talent, and um, yeah. you know, 
the future is promising for you know really really good players i think we just need more players now right you know the level is high sure we just need you know numbers now so how do we do that how do we grow this sport how do we build it yeah um i think that the school system's uh part of it um that's uh, we're on the right track but sure. i think we all need to get on to be honest with you i think we all need to get organized together like you have one group of players in the northeast that are you know promoting but mm -hmm. it needs to be a nationwide sure. thing there needs to be no there needs to be a system in every one of the one in every state sure you know mm -hmm. and then once you have something like that it would be great to have, you know have statewide competitions junior competitions you know yeah, new york absolutely. against you know new jersey or new york against pennsylvania that, or whatever great. whatever this is, uh, this is why we're doing idea. this uh podcast so yeah. we can get this information out yes. to people yeah. to hear yeah, maybe get everybody on the same page you know it's just well you know. it's it's gonna it's got to be a, a team effort sure. you can't have one person no. running everything everybody has to needs join to together wor work together yep. and put in some effort and and see results yeah. yeah you know and yeah. get some benefit out of it i mean i know a lot of people talk and a lot of people say this say that and you know we just have, people have to do it yeah and, and and i think you'll need help from the table manufacturer as well yeah. um, yes i would like to see um tornado or warrior for that matter um really get involved and you know you think about a, a tornado foosball table you're paying Fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars for, for a that. table. Yeah. They, oh, they keep going up. Right, sure. right. It keeps going up, and an average family can't just afford to drop, you know, close right. to a couple thousand dollars on a foosball table. Very yeah. true. So I'd like to see Tornado do something like Warriors. Find something affordable for, um, you know, for the average recreational player. They mm -hmm. they did you know, just build a, a table a, for the juniors for the schools, but yeah, that's, they that's did. still seven hundred dollars. Yeah, seven hundred bucks. Yeah, need, I, in my opinion, they need to be in the four to five hundred dollar you know price range. Sure, I mean people, um, people are going to go to Sears and buy you know one of those tables because it's it's affordable. Right. Exactly. You know? Right. Exactly. But the fact that they even made the attempt to to make a recreational model is you know I think that's a step in the right direction. Sure. No, no it's uh, it, it seems to me, um, especially when it comes to being competitive, uh, stepping into the sport and uh, walking into, let's say, a DYP on a, on a Friday night in any given town across this country, uh, you're going to find some pretty astounding players. Now, what do we do about the folks that are just stepping in and going, oh, my goodness, I am never going to be as good as these people. How do I how do we keep their interest? How do we keep them coming back? Well, that's the thing is there's such a difference in the level of play between the pro tournament player and yep. even the and even the beginner to rookie to amateur tournament mm -hmm. player. Like yep. uh, the rookie players could even get discouraged playing against top pros. Sure. And then there's even a level below that, which is going to be the bar, the barroom player, the rec, the recreational player. Yep. And the the rookie is so much better than the barroom player, you know, so there's such a huge, huge Gaps, difference, yeah. a big, it's, big gap. It's, in, it's a big learning curve for uh, yeah. football because so, you, you have to get the physical skills before you can even start playing the mental right. game. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. And, and to be honest with you, some people don't even really care to take it to that next level. They just enjoy playing. And right. we want, I think we want those players as well. Of because, course. Um, if you have, you know, 10 times as many of those players, some of them are going to filter in. Exactly. Sure yep. you know? Exactly. So uh, to be honest, I think we need to focus on, you know, separating the ranks. When you have a beginner, it, a beginner event, it needs to be a true beginner event. You don't want people sandbagging. You don't right. want, you, you don't want people to want to stay beginners and rookies and amateurs. Correct. You know, because you want that, you want them to move up and go into their respective ranks because all they're doing is discouraging the lower rated players. But you, I, I think um, there needs to be a, a beginner night at, at, yeah. a, at whatever local tournaments, you know, and say, okay, no tournament players and maybe a which, clinic to go with a yeah. clinic, Clinics, but yeah, yeah, only beginners recruit new players and just you know, free entry, you Keep know, fun. that's another fun. thing is you, in my opinion, you have to have free entry for for beginner. Yeah. You don't, you, mm -hmm. don't, you know, put in a trophy, you know, for them or we, we whatever. We do that at our draw, actually. Yeah. The first few times you come, you don't pay. You know, there's no, like, there's no yeah. reason a beginner or junior anybody. should be paying to enter. It's right, like agree. these things are expensive enough. Oh, you know, we're yeah, out. Parents, sure. parents can't afford to send their kids, uh, yeah. you know, all day to and pay the prices that we're paying. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's right. and we do it because we love it. But I mean, it's also a huge, huge expense. So that's why it took my my dad and I. It took me until two thousand three 
to get to my first world championships. I sure. wanted to go every year, but I mean, it was always in Dallas and we just couldn't afford yeah, it, you know, right. two entry fees, two flights, you know, yeah. hotel for five, you know, at a hundred and some odd dollars a night for it's, six, six nights. It's pricey. It's I've thousands. Been, I've been and, hearing yeah. these stories from Nino for a while now. He's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's got, he's got Sam and Hannah. I'm on my yeah. third job and, and, now just to support this <laughs> sport. You know, yeah. Kyler tagging along. Yeah. 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 So if you're yeah. listening to this, uh, this podcast, uh, keep in mind that Nino, uh, is is in desperate need of support. <laughs> yeah, so go. yeah, we're gonna start no. a GoFundMe. No, yeah, no, we're good. <laughs> no, no, we're good. <laughs> we got to support the youth, and uh, the parents come first. That's yeah, all there is yeah, to it. Yeah. So, so first of all, uh, Tony, I, I got I got to thank you so much for being here. Uh, one thing I want to ask you before we wrap up, wrap this up. Uh, first of all, foosball radio uh, is something that we're very proud of so far. Even though this is the first episode, uh, where do you see? something like this going give give us some advice what would you what would you like to hear us do i i honestly haven't put too much thought into it but one i think just unifying the players and giving i guess being a voice amongst okay. amongst all the players or we can talk about current issues sure. whether they're good whether they're bad um i think it's really important to we'll get it out there to, to, to get it out there Absolutely. and let everybody be heard I mean, there, there's so many possibilities. When, sure. You know, once you once you have the audience, mm -hmm. you can you can do so many things. For instance, uh, call in with questions to to pro you know pro players. You know, so, you know, people can we can discuss rules. You can discuss sure. anything. 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 Sky's that, the that, limit. Yeah, the sky's the limit. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't think it's really been done on a regular basis. I know a couple right. of people have attempted a couple so, podcasts, you, but well, we're we're uh, we're hoping to keep this rolling. We want to yeah. keep it consistent. We want to be yeah. on a regular mo monthly basis at least, and, yeah. and you know, if make not it, more. keep it fresh. Yep, no doubt. I know it's the first one, but hopefully you'll have me back later on. Well, once that's, you guys get that's things uh, rolling. anytime you want. Tony. We greatly appreciate that because uh, we we certainly like to have you come back more and more often because of the fact that you have such such an influence over the entire sport uh, as an individual uh incidentally do do you uh consider yourself a world ambassador when it comes to this uh no i don't i try not to think about it i just try to be uh, a foosball player just okay. like everybody else I gotcha. and and the best at it yeah i don't even think that yeah. i just play i take i go into a tournament and play one match at a time and i show up to my matches on time i don't want special treatment and i try and okay just I just no I, I'm, I'm I'm here to I'm here to play just like everybody else, right. and because I, cool. I just love to play, so I don't awesome. try not to think about those things. Well, now, you, now, Tony, we uh, we recently purchased uh, grips from you. Uh, yes. we've, we've been using them for a while, and they're very popular. Yes, I mean we we also sell uh, Wilsons also, but people seem to, to to want yours more. I mean they 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 love them really. Yeah, yeah. well, um, I've been pretty fortunate that. Uh, People have have continued to support me um, and the grips. It actually came about a few years ago. Um, one of the grip suppliers ran out of thin, uh, thin grips, and they only had these really thick, thick ones. And I I couldn't stand using them. I'm like, well, I, I could I could kind of do the same thing. So mm -hmm, I sure. um, I had a bunch of samples sent to me, and I had to go through you know hundreds of different types of grips. And I found one that that I liked and worked for me and um they ha i've had great response from everybody and yeah you know they are great so so yeah. where could uh people go to purchase your products or um, your grips or I, I just opened up a uh, a website it's tony com, and there's a awesome. small store that's still kind of under construction and I'm, i've got some other merchandise on there that i'm Good. that i'm working on um, but the grips are for sale on there and um I imagine you're going to do T-shirts and stuff like that, also. Yeah, yeah. I, I I've done a few T-shirts in the past, but I'm working on a few new designs right now. So uh, currently the the stock is sold out, but in the next uh, few weeks I should have some new stuff up there. So and everybody we'll, should expect it for it to be replenished. And, uh, yeah, it, it'll check, check the site. Yeah, make check sure, it out. You know, grips yeah. grips are definitely for sale on on the site, and um, I typically ship during the week because I'm at tournaments all the oh, time. So yeah. I try to get ship Tuesdays, Wednesdays. Um, so if they don't get to you right away, good I apologize. Know. But good I am on know. the road and I'm a well, I'm a one man show. <laughs> so we so. understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, foosball we player understand. slash business guy. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to get by doing yeah. doing what I love. So beautiful. That's, it, it's what we all love, right? right. You know. That is the that is the truth, and we are so grateful for you being with us today. This is this is an absolute honor talking to you, and just you know, 
celebrating with us our first episode of Foosball Radio. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll send you an advanced copy. How's that sound? That sounds <laughs> good. I'm, I'm uh, honored that you uh, chose me to be on the show, and I wish you the best of luck. It, it was an easy choice. Totally. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. Telling the story of foosball one player at a time. Foosball Radio. Hi, I'm Tom Robinson, executive producer and co-host of Foosball Radio. The team and I are thrilled you're taking the time to listen to the ultimate foosball podcast. Promoting the sport and telling the story of foosball one player at a time is our mission. Truth be told, we can't go it alone. So we need your feedback and input. Please take the time to email us with your thoughts, ideas, and critiques. Yep, we can take it. We'll share your feedback on future episodes of Foosball Radio, the ultimate foosball podcast. Email us now at info at foosballradio.com. And we are back, and yet again, I uh, want to thank Tony Spraderman for spending time with us discussing his uh, origins on Foosball Radio. Uh, I'm Tom Robinson. I'm with Nino Dijon, Chuck Dooley. So, Chuck, I understand that you've got some uh, some some origins. We call this episode Origins. And uh, what? where did Foosball really start? That's what I'm wondering. There's a lot of gray area there, Tom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, when I have been through Foosball, just about everybody I've talked to always says that Foosball originated in Germany. That's, that's okay, uh, what but, I thought. Uh, but uh, when I, I, I looked up some facts here from the World Table Soccer Almanac, which, okay. is, which is written by Johnny Lott and Kathy Brainerd. That's the official word. And, uh, well, it's, it's, it's probably the most in-depth uh, foosball research that's ever been done. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 And, uh, you know, they, they, they looked for all the patents and everything like that. And, ah, and, okay. And, and even they say, you know, just because they couldn't find the patent on something doesn't mean that 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 wasn't first or, or, you know, because a lot of people didn't get patents back then. And, yeah, right, right, right. And a right. lot of these, you know, patents might have been lost. There was a couple of World, War, World Wars uh, yeah. in between, <laughs> yeah. okay. You know, that uh, things got lost then. But anyway, here's what I found. Uh, Tell us, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> do, we get, do we get a drum roll for this? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The first patent was uh, actually in the United Kingdom in, oh, in interesting. Eight, 1890. Uh, there's actually uh, hardly any German patents for, for a long, long time. Huh. 1890? Really? 1890, yes. Wow. Interesting. And, uh, that's that's uh, uh, dinosaur age. And that no. doesn't even mean that the table, no. table was built. It just means they got a patent. So what do they call it? Uh, there was no name. Huh. It doesn't even tell what the patent was for. Interesting. But uh, what, what I did find was that France really uh, was probably the four leader in uh, France. Fo- foosball. Huh. Uh, in the early uh, 1900s, in 1903, uh, they had three tables uh, that, that were mass produced. I don't know about mass produced, but but produced. being manufactured, manufactured. Right. Yes. Yeah. They were, most of the tables up to that point where people would just build their own. You know, they they didn't really get built in a factory or anything. Interesting. <clears throat> they had the the Bonzini, the Stella, and the Re- Rene Pierre. Uh, so those are the those are the were the earliest tables that you can find as far as they. The, the, uh, as, as far tables. as name brands, yeah, that, yeah, that, you know, that, I mean, I, I didn't do all this research. I'm just going by what I what I can read in this book, sure. and I'm sure that they've, you know, gone over this with a lot of people. Yeah, it wasn't until uh, 1933 that the USA had a patent, according to them. Okay. Now hmm. I, I know that uh, one of our local players, Jesse, did some research for a T-shirt he did, and he, he okay. somewhere he found that 1922 was uh, the first patent in the United States. Huh, 22, so that was even early. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So, yeah. again, no name as to what, what it was called or what... Uh, no, no, okay. no. And, and it wasn't necessarily a patent for a table. It could have been just for a part, you know? It could have oh. been, you know... Anything, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like I said, it doesn't even well. say what the patent was for, so... Huh. You know, I'm, I'm just... So I know in, in, in uh, various uh, parts of the world, of course, there's different names because we call it table... Well, table soccer. Of course, soccer in our in our vernacular is different from, say, Europe because they call it football. Football. 
football, football, or tish football. I think tish football. Tish, yeah. tish football. There's some uh, football players that call it football. Yeah. Like mini football. Yeah. 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 No, it's 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 well. It's, certainly, there's that's, no universal term. Then. That's actually uh, where baby foot came from. Mm-hmm. Is it? Yeah. Okay. It, it wasn't the, the the small size of the foot of the man. It was baby football. Ah, okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, it, and it, and obviously, whoever came up with the idea must have been a soccer fan or a quote unquote football fan uh, back in the day of 1890. You say? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. well, what's interesting about that is in Europe, where they have soccer tournaments, uh, they have foosball outside the venues. Really, where people can play table soccer. Okay, so yeah. the the soccer fans obviously love foosball because, or sorry, table football because they they can play it indoors or or in between soccer or football matches. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And why don't we do that in this country? Well, first of all, we don't have soccer matches like that. We don't yeah. have the participation mm. uh, over there. I mean, it's it's like you, they, see, you, you see American football. Fill stadiums and they have tailgate parties yeah. and, right. and, and, right, right, right. and big shows out in the parking lot. Okay, that's what they do with soccer. Eat, sleep, and, and breathe it. They, they, yeah, there's actually uh, gangs of people that travel around with their soccer teams and go to every, all the games and stuff. Like and, a Grateful Dead concert, something like yeah, very similar. There you go. <laughs> and, there you go. And and, and 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 the opposing fans will play each other on the tables outside. That yeah. is that now. That's it, that's very interesting. I didn't know about that. That's I can see where that the passion must come, and, and of course the uh, well, uh, the competition comes from there, right? We need a little of that, I, I would say. We need some juice, yeah, yeah. yeah. Competition, okay. We need it. So we, we're we're uh, we're we're seeing where this is coming from uh, now. When did foosball actually start being played uh, on on a regular basis in the U.S.? Do you find that out? Well, like we talked about earlier, it's the tournament soccer table is where it really all started. Right. And that was in 1973 was when they started. And now, wasn't Bonzini actually being imported to this country, I think, like, right right during the Vietnam War or something? Some, I, somebody told me that a soldier brought home a Bonzini table. And Bonzini's been around for a long time. Actually, the longest state tournament in the United States is the uh, North Carolina states, huh. which, which started out as a Rene Pierre. Okay. And now is run by Alan Cribbs and it's Bonzini. I got it. I got it. Okay. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's fascinating because it has grown and then expanded uh, quite a bit in the 70s and 80s and then contracted again to where we are now. Yes. Uh, so now it's now the mission, of course, for those who are listening to Foosball Radio and those who are having, have an enthusiasm and, and uh, in, uh, love this, this sport, uh, need to band together, as it will, as, and uh, hopefully uh, re-expand or see, the, see it grow. Well, we're kind of hoping that this is going to be a little spark for it, Tom. I mean, if okay. we can get people we talking need... more, we can get people doing yeah, things more. Maybe we, maybe Anybody we... has any anything ideas? They, ideas anything they want to chime in about where, where can they uh, send their ideas Tom so the yeah. ideas can be sent to us info at foosballradio.com uh, if you want to just go to our website of course foosballradio.com that's a great source as well uh, we'd love to hear from you now of course this this episode this first episode of foosball radio is called origins give us an idea where did you start why did you get into foosball what was your motivation and how can we uh, as a group of foosball enthusiasts, get this sport back to where it should be. Love to hear about that. Yeah, let's grow it. I got Whatever a few more uh, milestones here, Tom. Yes. Uh, TS, like I said, was started by Lee Prepard in 1973. Dynamo started in 1970. But I guess uh, in 1982, Johnny Lott came on and they redesigned the table. Okay. And uh, that made it a, a, a more playable table, the way the, the style of play that uh, people were using. Understood. Hurricane was invented in 1961, or 1969, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. We'll, we'll let you slide <laughs> on that one, right, Chuck. We'll, we'll hold you to it, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tornado started in 1971. 71? It wasn't popular, though, anywhere outside of Texas. Huh. Uh, it was, it was uh, built by a Texas guy, and a couple of guys, actually, Bob Hayes and Bob Fur. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they had uh, a big route in, in Dallas and, and, and Houston, but really it didn't, it didn't go anywhere else away from there okay because everybody else was playing tournament soccer and uh then dynamos because that's where the, the money tournaments were right 
But when uh, Dynamo stopped doing tournaments, Tornado took over. Just and, jumped in. And that's, yeah. when, that's when they really got big. Yeah. You know, they, they, they went, you know, throughout the country. And then even, there's, I mean, you talk to international, international players, they may not like the Tornado table the best, but they'll tell you it's the best table. Yeah. yeah. The best you know, made. The best oh, yeah. made table. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, the limited amount of time I've spent uh, playing on other tables, I've noticed that uh, Tornado just has the best parts. They seem to have the, the most solid construction. Just seems to be, it stands up to competition more. Yeah, it's, I mean, as a vendor, when I was vending tables, it was perfect because it, it just stands up, it lasts, you know. I mean, yeah. it, those tables and bars take a lot of abuse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and the Tornado could, you know, could handle it. It's yeah. uh, the, literally the acid test. Uh, yeah. they, they stand up to it, yeah. Probably the uh, the last table to come on the uh, uh, scene is the Warrior Table with uh, Brendan Flaherty. Yeah. Okay. That started in uh, 2003. That recently? Yeah. Okay, I had no idea. Now, there's also something called a Fireball. Now, what is what is a Fireball? Fireball is a, uh, it's a, it's a Chinese uh, table, actually. Oh. It's, it's, we, yeah, it's popular in Asia and China and we, that part of the world. Yeah, okay. that part of the world. We, we had some around the Albany area for a while, but okay. uh, it, it, they didn't seem to catch on. Mm. It, it's a good table. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I liked it. Yep, yep. Just a different kind of play. Yeah, it, people, you know, they get stuck in their ways. They 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 don't want to change. <laughs> I got I got that. Yeah. No, it's it's it seems this especially this generation now are being raised on tornado and uh, that's that's where you start. That's kind of where you tend to stay. I mean, I can remember uh, myself personally. You know, when when. Dynamo went away, and Tornado became the table that everybody was playing tournaments on. Yep. I almost quit. Interesting. I mean, because everything that I was doing on Dy Dynamo didn't transfer. Right. Uh, yeah. I was doing a lot of banks and things like that, and, you know, you, you get on Tornado, and it was like I, I felt like a fool. <laughs> too, too, too different. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, yeah. Well, there's one thing I do notice about, you know, as an, a casual observer when it comes to the Tornado players, uh, there seems to be a lot more strategy involved. Um, it's not just, you know, uh, spray and pray or, or uh, you know, just hit the ball as hard as you can. It's more of a, a much more deliberate, very, uh, very calculated kind of kind of play. Yeah, yeah they call that uh, Texas style foosball, actually. Yeah. Texas style. That, that's where the origins of that is, the Texas style. Yeah, they were the first ones to really set the ball up and... and have get a plan. A, get, get a passing series, okay. things like that. I mean, in the, in the in the beginning, a lot of people were just you know, uh, like the Italians right now. They they don't move the ball around. They don't pass they it. Throw it on the table and, and hack and, away. You know, and just hit it. Whatever that ball lands, you're you're hitting at it. Right. You know? Okay. Kind of like roller ball. Would you be. know, whereas <laughs> whereas you know, with uh, a lot of the tornado players, they're they're you know, uh, setting the ball up on the on the five bar, doing passing series, and yes, you know. Very methodical about it. Uh, same thing with their shots. Their precision. Pro There's precision and much more challenging thought. too. Yeah, it, it, much more patient. Right. Sure. Is really what it is. It's it's patience. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the basic rules, of course, in, include the amount of time you can keep possession of the ball. Let's say. Well, that's where the, those time limits came from, actually. Okay. Because these guys would would set the ball up like on their five bar and not move it, and, <laughs> okay. ju and just wait wait for you to to, to do something, <laughs> and then. They would pass it through. Okay. So now you had, had they they made a rule that you had to you know hit two guys before you could pass it. Yes. Right? Then there was guys that they would take the next uh, advantage. They would just bounce it off the wall fifty times until you came off it. Right. And then they would then do their pass. wall pass. Okay. So that, these that's where they, the rules. That's where that's where they come up with the three wall rule. Okay. You know? And there's you know, a book of rules. <clears throat> book of rules. Oh, yeah, there. we'll have to get that book of rules out and have it handy. All those rules came about because somebody figured out a way to get around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very. No, I, mm -hmm. I I get that completely, and I, I appreciate it now. Now that I've started to play with people like yourselves, uh, why these rules exist? Uh, of course, no spinning. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the other thing, of course, is is uh, how much time you're allowed to to hold onto the ball in a certain part of the table. Fifteen seconds up front. Uh, what is it? Ten seconds on the five row. Yeah, um, correct. Yeah, I mean, this makes a whole new. It's a whole new dimension, especially from uh, from a Bonzini player who you know is is basically hit it as hard as he can and and hope it goes in. But uh, yeah, this is this is evolved. So what else can you share with us, Chuck? Uh, ISTF uh, had their first World Cup in, in May of two thousand six. And ISTF Hamburg, is international. Is international. Uh, what is it? The uh, International Table Soccer Federation. Oh, cool. so it's a federation. Yes. Okay. Yep. Is it based in Europe or is it based in the U.S.? I think he's out of France. 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 But the first, exactly. The first uh, uh, 
major tournament they did was in Hamburg, Germany, though. Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yep. again, uh, in this country, what do we have? Is, in, in anything equivalent to that in this country? Well, they're actually the governing body now uh, because we follow their rules. Yeah. And it's not uh, the same rules that we used to have in the United States. They were altered to, so that now the same rules are used all over the, uh, the world okay. on, on all the different tables. Which makes sense. You know, instead of having all these different tables, have all these different rules, it's, it's, it's all been centralized, and, and, and uh, they, they do a good job of, uh, you know, making it work. Sure, and, and uh, so what is the USTS? That's USTSO is uh, the United States uh, Table Soccer Association or organization. Got it. That's that's a new organization that's, that's just, new. just right. happening now. Oh. I don't even know if they've actually uh, gotten past the the initial stages of it yet. They're still okay trying Organizing. to find the, trying to find the, the people, the leaders, and 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 get it organized. Yeah, right. but we we should give them some airtime, maybe. Oh, yeah, hope, sure. yeah. Hopefully, that's going to be you know a, a very big turning point for this game. You know? Okay, that, that could, I think it is. I think it's heading in the right direction with that. Yeah. You yeah, know, we'd definitely like to hear what they have to say. Definitely. No question. Yeah. I, I know that uh, we're going to be interviewing Terry Rue, and he's uh, yes. very integral in that. He's yes. uh, pr the president. Of, is uh, he the president? Yeah, he he's is? the okay. president. Well, there you yeah. go. So, all right. Hopefully, we can get him on and get his insights on it. That would yeah. be awesome. That yeah. would be phenomenal. So, yeah, very cool. So, where we're going with it? Yeah, where are we going, guys? Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> What's next, Chuck? I, I'm kind of running out of stuff here, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I what I meant to ask, and maybe I should be more specific, is where do you guys want to go with this? What what uh, what do you envision for foosball radio and and uh, what we're doing right now? I think what I envision is what we're doing. We're, we're getting the word of foosball out to foosball players. Yes, sir. And and hopefully to people that want to be foosball players, and we can mm -hmm. get more people involved. And we yeah. want to hear. We want to hear from the foosball players and the wanna be foosball players and. You know, you know the, what 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 we can do or how we can get the word out there, and yep. maybe maybe we can motivate some people to start local tournaments, sure. or, or you know, sure, get 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 things going more. How about uh, school districts like uh, Mark Jolette? Mark Jolette oh, yeah. is in, what, is in uh, Plattsburgh. What Mark's done is a miracle up there. Yeah, I mean, it's, John O'Brien, you know, who started it. It's it's just, yeah. I mean, it's uh, and it's growing, you know. I, wow. I, I can't remember what he said. I think he had like 70 or 80 players. Yeah. Really? Students, yeah. you know, playing foosball. That's exciting. At, at, at his school. That's really exciting. You know, kids that didn't want to come to school, they come to school because they get to play foosball, and that's what they, you know, besides. And now they enjoy school, and their grades are up, and, you know, they have motivation. I yep. mean, he told me of one student that he had that the year prior – uh, had missed like 40 something days of school. Right. No kidding. Yeah. But, wow. But, you know, Mark had told him he couldn't play foosball unless he was coming to school. Well, there you go. And, yeah. and, and this year, he's, I think, missed one day or something. Interesting. Sure. You know? Okay. So, I mean, foosball can help out. I mean, foosball can, can make things happen, and, and especially in schools with kids. Team I mean, building. It, team building. Team building. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, yep. Enthusiasm. it's sportsmanship. Yep. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun <laughs> yeah yeah no it's, I, yeah, I wished it uh, is uh, in in high school that we had tables we didn't uh we had to go to the pizzeria yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't turn out so bad but i mean still i mean it's the kind of thing that in schools i, I would love to play let's say on a scholastic team sure absolutely Definitely. competing against other schools would have been so cool there's no reason it can't happen yeah no reason and it no. should happen you know, like, like nino said john o'brien uh you know he's 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 the founder he's, of he's, uh, he's got it you know down to where you know he gets he can show you how to get uh tables into schools and how to yeah. how to mentor it okay. mentor mentoring is key yeah because you, you can't just put a table in a school and expect good things to happen sure yeah. sure you know because they don't know how to play they 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 need structure they need to know how to play Absolutely. what the rules are and someone to you know, to, not, not to, to yell uh, and scream uh, not, to, not to spin yeah. <laughs> how know? about an adult to go in and do some coaching yeah, yeah. there's a way to play the game and it needs to be it needs to be taught yeah. The right way. 
Yep, yep. I totally so. get that. No, I, I think this is uh, this is at least a, a good place for, 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 from which we can, uh, um, uh, shall we say, podcast uh, the word for people who want to make this happen. Uh, because I know there's there's plenty of us sure. uh, to, who want to see this happen and, of course, increase the sport and, of course, increase the interest. And naturally, everybody benefits. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, like, when, when you talk to foosball players, they all want to make it happen. They all would love to see foosball be big. Yep. What we need are people to take those little steps. It's, put, a, put, a, put a table in a school and, and just sure. go there once a week and help them out. Right, 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 right. Maintain the table, keep, uh, keep the kids uh, interested and you, you uh, form get, squads. And, you take care of those little steps locally and, yeah. and they become big steps nationally. Absolutely. Yep. You know? And someday, I, this is just pie in the sky stuff, but I, I don't know why, but in, in Europe they have what they call training centers yeah. in every country, uh, whether they be national or regional, whatever the case, but it seems to me that Ultimately, uh, maybe in this country, uh, in a regional basis, we could put together training centers as well that, that are sponsored by the USTS or uh, that are opened by a specific organization across the country where, yeah. where people can go and, uh, and enjoy the sport. It would, be, that, it would be great to say. Yeah. yeah, and that's the other thing. Uh, you, you talk to any foosball player, they're going to tell you this sport needs uh, sponsorship. Yeah. Okay? Yep. So we need to find sponsors. I mean, yeah. if, if anybody out there has ideas about sponsors, I mean, we're, we'd be more than happy to hear about them. I mean, we, of course. We could broadcast them and maybe even act on them. Right. Yep. You know? yep. right. Yep. Yeah, we invite anyone who, who has uh, ideas and, uh, uh, shall we say, enthusiasm for the sport, of course, to contact us. Again, our, inf our, our information email is info at foosballradio.com. Uh, our website is foosballradio.com uh, we're, we're, we are so uh, happy and uh, uh, excited about this first episode uh, so many things that uh, we are looking forward to and chomping at the bit shall we say to get uh, get into as far as topics are concerned in fact uh, guys I think that uh, uh, I think the next episode, perhaps we could do the next generation. We could talk That's, about that. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. About about the, the the rising stars like Sam Dijon, uh, Hannah Yeager. So we need to to uh, certainly uh, make it clear that uh, the reason we're we're sitting here and doing this uh, this podcast, foosball radio, uh, is all about building the sport. Uh, it is something that uh, we're passionate about, and we hope you share that same passion. And please let us know how you feel at info at foosballradio.com. Uh, coming up in the next episode, you'll be hearing a lot more about the rising stars. It's going to be, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll dub it right now, the next generation. That's coming up in our, in our next episode. And uh, again, we'll be, uh, we'll be certainly seeking out your ideas and input. And even if you have some complaints about my voice, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> you, you may uh, contact us at info at uh, foosballradio.com. Uh, my thanks to Nino Dijon. Nino, any parting shots? I'd like to thank you, Tom. I mean, it's, it's, we're heading in the right direction. This is what we want to do is to grow the sport. Uh, build the youth and uh, whatever we can do for the sport. You got it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chuck, parting shots. I, I'd just like to see that other people get involved yeah. with us. You know, I'd okay. like to see that jump aboard. You know, people contacting you in droves with ideas and yes. and and suggestions and things we could do and and we can talk about those suggestions on the air. Right. And and <laughs> if and if we talk about a suggestion that somebody comes up with and we mention it. You know, whoever hundreds of people hear it, yes, two or three of them only need to act. And it's not you know? so much of uh, telling us, you know, climb aboard, really? help us, help us do it. Yes, you know, help us do it because as a team, we can all do it, we and that's together. really what we want to do. Yep. Who doesn't want to see this sport become great again? I want to see it in the Olympics. There you, know? you go. Now there's. You want to see something. it in the Olympics? I'd love that. Let's I, hear that. I, we see uh, cornhole on on TV. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's crazy. We don't see foosball on TV. Right. right but foosball's right, right. been around what, a long time. Your, your memory's probably better than mine, but it was on ESPN years ago. What What year was that? Do you know? Do you remember? You know? 
I, I don't, but it's... It, it was the 70s, wasn't it? Or? In the se- well, ESPN I want to say along. it was 83. Yeah. I, was it, it 83? Might have been. Yeah. I want to say, don't quote me on it, but I want to say... Uh, I mean, it's out there. The footage is there. I mean, if, if, if we were on ESPN back then, why can't we be on it tomorrow? Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Especially with some of these bigger tournaments. Yeah. Uh, there's no yeah. reason. Yeah. No reason. <laughs> no question. And incidentally, uh, speaking of which, I do want to, to give a shout out to uh, one of our compatriots in this industry. Uh, who's been doing this a long, long time with Netpoost TV, uh, Jim Stevens. Oh, um, Jim is the best. Yeah, he is he's a classy guy. He just brings so much drama to the, the play-by-play. And I think that... Uh, Foozcaster. Foozcaster, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's not anybody that's great at foosball out there that doesn't have some way to thank Jim. Yeah, or, absolutely. I mean, yep. just, absolutely. From the way, just from the way he commentated, the... the watching the videos that he produced yep. there, there wouldn't be a, anything like that those are the best teaching tools out there yes I you mean, get to see the best at what they do and, and, it's, and, and it's not just like a grainy you know cell phone camera no, you know, from, no, a, ba- from a bad a, angle it's a professional it's, you know, real like deal professionally the done, real are, deal the cameras yep. are in the right angles at the right times and you know it's I often wonder how he does this because it seems like it's, he's just the only guy doing it and I just don't but yeah hats off to Jim for yeah. sure no he's the best thanks yeah. Jim <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Well, this is uh, the uh, this is amazing. I think that uh, I, I'm so looking forward to the for the to the next episode. But uh, you guys, uh, thank you so much for for uh, making this possible. Uh, Foosball Radio is is officially underway, and we're looking forward to uh, every episode we can possibly get our hands on here. So uh, let's let's do this. Let's rock it. And again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we will, uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. This next episode will be called The Next Generation. It is Foosball Radio. Thanks, and we'll talk to you again soon.